what's up what's up it's your girl neek and you're tuned in to neek at night and tonight i'm gonna be doing a full breakdown of this quiet on the set documentary now shout out to my night owls who was like neek have you watched it let's watch it together you know shout out to my girl unforgettable she was like neek like let's get this rolling so I ended up watching the documentary. I watched all four parts and I'm going to basically give you guys a full breakdown recap of what happened in the documentary. Now, I was able to watch it on like one of those little streaming sites or whatever, but I think they have this playing on HBO Max if I'm not mistaken, but you know, I seen how I was able to see it. Anyways, so I'm going to give a full breakdown of what was talked about. I'm going to give a breakdown to the best of my ability while I was watching it. I was like taking screenshots of certain things. So I'm going to be, you know, posting certain things on the screen that was talked about at certain points in time to kind of give you guys reference points for those of, of you guys who have not seen it, just so that we're all on the same accord. Now, Quiet on the Set is based on Nickelodeon, and we all grew to love that the shows, or me, for example, um, <clears throat> that was one of the channels that we had growing up. You know, we had two kid shows growing up. We had Nickelodeon and we had Disney. I kind of gravitated between Nickelodeon a little bit more than I did Disney. I think the shows that I liked on Disney was like Recess. I wasn't as big of a Raven fan as a lot of my peers. Um, I watched some of the shows, but I really didn't like it that much. Um, so I kind of gravitated outside of like my one of my favorite TV shows or cartoons, Recess, being on Disney. All the other shows that I loved was on Nickelodeon. And one of the big shows that I really, really loved was All That. That was one of my favorites. Um, my favorite character from the show was, uh, uh, what was her name? Lori, Lorianne, Lori, Lori, Lori. Lori Lori Beth Denver was her name, I believe. But anyways, I really liked her character. She was like one of my favorites. I really liked Kenan and Kel, obviously. And, you know, I really gravitated to the shows like Legends of the Hidden Temple, um, Are You Afraid of the Dark, um, Nick at Night, <laughs> okay, where Are You Afraid of the Dark came on. I mean, my channel is literally derived <coughs> from a play off of you know, the network's name. So I was a, a huge fan of Nickelodeon and I, you know, grew up with a lot of these child stars. So to see this documentary and see all the stuff that these people was going through behind the scenes was really like heartbreaking to watch and see the things that they literally had to go through and how things unfolded. So um, I'm going to kind of break down how everything unfolded in the documentary. It was a four part documentary. Now I scribble scrabbled on my paper and jotted down some notes just so that I can kind of keep up with everything that was said. So, um, I have not gone over this. I ha I don't even, I haven't even like read my writing back. So I'm going to try to get through this the best that I can. But basically when the store, when the documentary first starts out, it starts out with like a couple of actors basically talking about their dislike for the main guy, Dan Snyder, who was the curator of a lot of these shows that we grew to love. Now, Dan Snyder was the person who he was kind of like brought on as a, like, you know, the guy to like produce some of these shows and everything like that. And he had like a lot of creative control over like the writings of the show, producing of the show and things like that. And it starts out with them talking about how people felt like he created a very toxic environment for them to work in. And he they also started to bring up like Amanda Bynes and her role in Nickelodeon and, you know, things like that. Once they kind of bring up um, Amanda Bynes and they talk about this woman by the name of I believe her name was Katrina Jones. She talked about how she was a childhood star there and while she was there, they basically started to feel like she was getting a little chunky and they didn't really like that she was getting a little plump. So she talked about how they reached out to her parents and they was basically telling her like, you know, 
what can we do to get this girl, you know, skinny? Like, we already have a fat person on the show, um, and we don't really want another fat girl on the show. And so, you know, they kind of took that, like, kind of, like, sideways. Like, you know, she's already an active girl. She's doing dance. She's doing all these things. Like, there's really nothing else that's going to make her be skinny. Like, that's literally what she is. And so as she got older, she started to, I guess, look a little bit more mature than they liked. She talked about how she basically, and I'm going to put her picture on the screen. This is her right here. Her name is Katrina. So it starts out with, you know, them really going into her story and her saying that she kind of was at the lab factory. She seen Amanda Bynes doing this skit. And other people from Nickelodeon, Dan Schneider, and she kind of told them about <clears throat> Amanda Bynes. Once they seen Amanda Bynes, they kind of got a liking to Amanda Bynes because she was brilliant. She was comedic. She was fresh. She was young. She was, you know, basically Katrina's replacement, and she didn't even realize it. And they talked about how Dan basically cultivated this breakout star in Amanda Bynes and how he followed her career all the way up until she was, you know, venturing off into other networks and going into other shows and how they kind of premised it like the relationship between Dan and Amanda was kind of like on some creepy stuff, but they don't flat out say it because obviously Amanda's not, she was not a part of the documentary to tell her story. So they kind of alluded that there was something like very, weird and creepy going on with them. They talked about how Amanda would like, you know, be caressing him and how they would just be like really close and how they alluded to like the, the interactions between them being like not really appropriate. So they talked about that. And then they start talking about these two writers who got a job on writing the Amanda show. And so the, the writers by the name of Christy and Jenny, they talked about how, they both were given a job offer of being writers on the show, but because Dan kind of didn't really have respect for women, um, <laughs> you said, was she fat or thick? Um, so anyways, uh, so you threw me off street. Let, let me not look at the chat, okay? So anyways, um, so... A woman by the name of Christy and Jenny, they start telling their story and they talk about how, you know, Dan Snyder didn't really think highly of women. And so he approached or they got approached with a job offer and their job offer to work as writers on Nickelodeon was basically a salary that they had to share amongst each other. So it was like a salary that was supposed to go to one person and this is how much they pay for one person they had to literally join in and split their salary and and share like the profits of one salary and being fresh new writers and women who wanted to get into entertainment they were both thrilled to take on the job even though they were highly 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 underpaid and their male counterparts was getting full salary however they had to share their salary so they go into talking about their story and how when they worked there, there was a lot of inappropriate things that would happen in the workplace. They would talked about how when they would be working there, like Dan would want certain people to like massage him and things like that. And they also talked about how he would have them say inappropriate things out loud. So like he would write them on their computers or send some type of message and whenever he would send them a message, they would have to like yell it or blurt it out out loud. And they would have to say things like I'm an idiot or a slut or just random things that he would like message them on their computers. And if they didn't say it, then he would kind of like send all caps to them and basically have them, you know, recite or say what it is that he wanted them to say. This is one of the women right here. Her name was, I believe, Christy. And she talked about her experience on the show. And it also was this woman right here by the name of Jenny. And she also talked about her time on the show. And these are the two women who had to share their salary with one another. And they basically had to live off of, you know, that situation. So it showed their 
times in their early beginnings of how they were very happy to be on the show, how they were happy to be writers on the show, but how they realized very quickly that they kind of had to just fall in line, get get in line and fall in line and just kind of like go with whatever was thrown at them. So they talked about their stories. They talked about how um, there was this one time when the woman by the name of uh, uh, Christy, her on the screen right here, she was kind of talking about a time where she was like, rehashing a high school story or something like that. And Dan kind of told her and kind of like made her like lean over on the desk to like tell this story about high school. And she had to act like she was being like sodomized. And at first she kind of like said no, like she didn't really want to do it. And he kind of pressured her to kind of like continue on with the story that she was telling and she had to like act like you know she was being sodomized while she was telling this story so they talked about that situation they talked about how like um they were not really allowed to have a personal life like they literally had to dedicate all of their life to the show they had to dedicate every single hour to the show and how you know, there started to be like weird demands. So there was this one time where Dan basically asked the girl, Christy, this girl right here, he asked her to eat two pints of ice cream or something like that. I think it was two pints of ice cream and he was going to pay her $300. And she was like, she was kind of broke. She just went with it and she did it. And she she ate the two pints of ice cream, but he never paid her for it. And so after that, he kind of like would kind of throw around different things in the office. And I think one thing that she said was he said, oh, um, swat this fly or somebody killed this fly. I'll give you thirty dollars. And she kind of was like, oh, so should I build a tab, you know, for the other thing that you didn't pay me for? And so I think she said that he kind of like took her in the back and he like scolded her and reprimanded her. And after shortly after that, she went to a concert and hung out with some friends or something like that. And then she was ultimately fired. Then it went to talking about um, a child star. And, and these these aren't in any particular order that it was talked about in the first episode. But I'm just kind of basically breaking down like the different things that kind of they talked about in the episode. So they kind of segued from talking about their story and they talked about some of the childhood stars stories and some of the inappropriate things that they had to deal with. One of the childhood uh, stars was this guy right here who his character was nose boy on Nickelodeon. Now I don't remember his character, but apparently his character was nose boy and they talked about how uncomfortable um, the, the costumes were because the costumes were reminiscent of a male genitalia and how they felt like it just looked inappropriate and it looked like, you know, nuts in a wanky. So they talked about that. They talked about how he was uncomfortable with the whole character. And I believe um, there was this other character this other guy who was like the youngest, he was a black, another black boy. And his role was to be the youngest rapper. And so his role was to be, and I think, I don't know if this was in episode two or episode one, because, um, hold on, let me see if this was episode two or episode one. Okay, now I'm going to wait for episode two to talk about that. So anyway, so they segued back to talking about the writers. And they talked about how the writer by the name of Jenny, she kind of found out that it was illegal for her and the other writer to be sharing a salary. So she, somebody told her or she kind of got information that it was against the law for her and the other writer to be sharing and she called the Writers Guild. 
So once she called the Writers Guild and told them basically what was happening, that she had to share and split one salary with the other writer, Dan Schneider called her and scolded her and basically threatened her and told her that... um, Was it her that kind of tipped off the Writers Guild that they were sharing a salary? And was it her that had anything to do with it? And if it was her that had anything to do with it, that he was basically going to blackball her and she was never going to be able to work in the business ever again because, you know, he had all these connections with all of these people and it would kind of like doom her. So... It goes on to say that the one girl ended up getting fired. The girl, um, hold on. This one got fired for hanging out. And then Jenny, right, am I mixing up their names? Jenny, she continued working. So this was season one of the show. And then she basically um, got a job offer to work on season two of the show. So when she got her job offered to work for season two of the show, I believe that he said that he could pay her for 16 weeks and 11 weeks that she would have to like work for free. So 16 of the weeks she would get paid and then 11 of the weeks that she would have to work for free. And that was literally like the job offer that was offered to her. And it's like, (laughs) why would anybody take that? But I guess because she wanted to make a name for herself and she was very hungry to be in the business, she accepted that job offer of being paid 16 weeks and 11 weeks free. So she said that she ended up accepting the offer. She started working on the show for season two. And she said that she only lasted for about four days in season two she said there was this one particular time that dan called her in the room and even before that there was a new guy who got hired on and this was his first time working no credits no prior work history nothing he was a male guy and he got paid full salary and nothing like no freebies nothing He had no prior work history or anything. He got paid a full salary and her being a person who worked a full season, she was only being awarded 16 weeks of pay. So she says there was a time after that where it was like four days into her working on the second season where she basically walked, he called her in and it was like all the male writers in the room. And so when she went into the room, he basically was like, didn't you tell me that you used to be a phone, um, a phone operator, you know, an adult phone operator or whatever. And then she was like, what? Like, no, like, I didn't tell you that. And he basically was like, I could have sworn you told me that you used to be like this adult phone operator. Like, didn't you used to do that before? And I guess from that, she just felt like icky. Like it just, it made her feel like, you know what? Enough is enough to heck with this. I'm out of here. She said that at that moment, she quit her job and she filed a lawsuit against Dan Schneider and Nickelodeon. And she won her lawsuit against him because she cited basically unfair working conditions, uh, being underpaid, how she had to split her salary, the things that she had to deal with, all of the innuendos and things that she had to deal with. She sued him and he continued to be able to be the head front runner of the show. So um, that was episode one. So then we go into episode two. So episode two, it starts off with this mother telling her story about how her daughter was a guest star on the Amanda show. So let me pull her up because I took screenshots and I'm going to be pulling certain screenshots. So this woman right here, she was telling her story and they opened up episode two with her 
And she basically started talking about how her daughter and a girl by the name of Brandy, and this is her daughter right here, Brandy, was on the show and she was a guest star on the show. So this was the episode the episode that her daughter um, participated in. And it was like a classroom show where they had dancing lobsters. And her daughter is here with the bucket hat. And she just guest appeared on the show, I want to say, like one time. And while her mother brought her to the show, there was a guy by the name of Jason who was the production assistant. So this guy right here was the production assistant and he was very friendly with the mom, friendly with the girl, and he exchanged emails with her daughter and information with her daughter. So the mom starts talking about how she allowed her daughter and this grown man to be emailing each other together. And so she was allowing them to email each other. And she says that the first couple of emails that she seen between her daughter and him seemed to be innocent in nature. She seemed to be talking like, you know, oh, you know, I work on this show. I'm the production assistant. I work on this show. I work on that show, yada, yada. And she felt like, oh, it's innocent. And she allowed this grown man to email back and forth on several occasions with her daughter. So eventually these emails sound like they started to not be monitored. She just thought that, you know, oh, you know, she's emailing with this guy and, you know, no big deal or whatever. And as her daughter is emailing with him, she notices that one day her daughter is angry and upset and she shuts off her computer and after she shuts off her computer, she runs in her room and slams her. I mean, she slams her door, shuts off the computer and she notices that her daughter starts crying. Right. So she noticed that her daughter was crying. And so she went to go check on her daughter to see what was going on between this grown man who was writing emails to her daughter I mean, no, not even the grown man, but she went to go see what was going on with, with her daughter. So when she went to go see what was going on with her daughter, her daughter told her that he had sent her a photo of himself completely no clothes on, and he was whacking his wanker in the photo. So the mom goes and looks. She sees this picture. He's he's no clothes on. He's whacking his wanker. And this is a picture that he emailed to her daughter. And so the mom looks at it and she's like, what the heck? So she goes between, should I call the cops? Should I not call the cops? And ultimately she decides not to call the police. So she's like, oh, well, you know, um, I started to think about what people would think about me. What what would people think that I allowed my daughter to email this guy? And what would the police think? And what would people think if I, I told and all of these things? And so she did nothing about it. She did nothing about it. She just said, oh, well, you know, I don't want anybody to think anything of me. So she did nothing about it. She didn't warn Nickelodeon. She didn't warn anybody. She didn't call the cops. She did nothing about it. OK, because she was scared or she feared that people would judge her. So she just so-called cut off communication with him and her daughter. OK, so they talk about how she did nothing. OK, and then after they talk about how she did nothing, then they start talking about. Um, they segued. And they start talking about this other cast member and then they get back to him. So before they get back to giving us the full story on, you know, how things played out with this guy, they then go and they start talking about this black character by the name of Brian Hearn. OK, so they start talking about Brian and this is Brian right here. And I'm just kind of. um. 
So they start talking about Brian. And actually, I'm going to just tell you the full story of what happened with her. And I'll, I'll get to Brian later. I'll, 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 I'll get to Brian later. Because anyways, so basically, she did nothing about it. Okay? Because I, I wrote notes as I was watching it. Because, you know, this is how they presented it. But let me just tell you the full story on that. And then we'll get back to Brian. So anyways, so she gets a call randomly one day. And I think it was some time had passed. Um, I think years had passed. I, I, it was either months or years. I think I think it was years that had passed, right? And randomly, a detective calls her phone. And they asked her, oh, do you know anything about Jason? Are you familiar with the name Jason? Whatever, and they tell her his name. And she goes, yeah, I'm familiar with Jason. I'm familiar with who that is. And so the detectives basically tell her that they found inappropriate things between her daughter and Jason in his home after they did an investigation for a whole nother other girl that he had been caught doing inappropriate things with. Okay. So they call her and they tell her that they found the Ziploc bag. And basically the guy, Jason, this guy right here, he basically had interest in different girls, right? That he was being a pred to, you know? And her daughter was one of them. And another girl... They found these Ziploc bags, right? And so in the Ziploc bags was letters from her daughter to him. And he kept them as like a token in his little ped hole, you know, his little his little fantasy land, pedal land or whatever, you know. So he had a Ziploc bag with all these letters of her daughter in it. So they contacted her like, do you know like about anything inappropriate? Da, 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 da. And they tell her all of the things that they're uncovering about him. So come to find out they did an investigation and each girl that he kind of was preying on, he had some type of token from them. There was a seven year old girl who he had a Ziploc bag with her panties in the bag. Then they talked about there was another girl who was a guest star on the show, Cousin Skeeter. So they talked about this girl. She was nine years old. She was just a guest star. So she wasn't like one of the people who had like a reoccurring role. She was a guest star on Cousin Skeeter. Somehow her parents allowed this grown man to build a relationship with her. You know, he's promising that he can get her on shows and promising things. And so they were alone in a, a room, a bedroom together. So they're in the bedroom together, him and this nine-year-old girl. And while they're in the bedroom together, they're playing video games. So as they're playing video games, he goes and he's kissing the nine-year-old girl and trying to force his tongue down her throat now the girl starts to get uncomfortable about it she starts to feel like you know like you know this isn't you know this isn't right and anything like that and he basically tells her oh well you know i'm gonna get you these jobs i you know i'm working on all these shows i'm gonna get you a you know more acting jobs etc cetera, etc cetera, and tells her not to tell her parents about it so, um, then they talked about how they found all these journals where he would talk about the interactions that he would have with these girls. And he would also talk about how like fantasies that he had and everything like that. They said that, um, in his journals, he would call himself a pet and he would say, you know, I'm a ped. And he said that he struggled on a day-to-day -day basis on how he could find a victim to our word if he had to. Okay? 
So they end up getting the girl Brandy to testify against him. And there was several parents who they found little like tokens in these like Ziploc bags and any appropriate things that he said in these journals. They said that there was 10,000 images that he had of children on his computer. They had uh, 1,768 images of young girls in erotic poses on his computers. 238 images of young girls in explicit poses. Two images of girls in bondage and seven CDs of explicit conduct with kids, okay? So with all of this information and all of these kids that he came in contact with, the detectives tried to get so many people to cooperate with the investigation. They tried to get all of these parents to get him basically thrown under the jail because they had all of this evidence all of these Ziploc bags, all of these interactions with different children that he had these inappropriate things with, and majority of the parents declined to participate in the investigation. It boiled down to the mom, Brandy. I mean, this girl, Brandy, and the girl from Cousin Skeeter testifying against him and getting him um, arrested ultimately out of all the people that he had, you know, evidence and everything, they the parents would not cooperate and would not um, go through with it. He was arrested. <clears throat> and when he was arrested, he basically was sentenced to six years in jail in 2003. So... He was sentenced to six years. We know that he's been out long, <clears throat> long since then. And it didn't really tell <clears throat> what he's doing with his life now. They didn't really go on to that. Now, also in episode two, they talked about Brian Hearn. So I'm going to go to um, episode three in a second, but they talked about Brian Hearn. So Brian Hearn was an actor on the show and he was this black kid that was on the show and he talked about how he didn't really have a close relationship with Dan Schneider. He didn't really have a close relationship with some of the people of the show and he kind of was, you know, buddy buddy with the kids. But he noticed that there was a, a like a, a stark dynamic between him and the white counterparts that he had that he worked with on the show. So they started talking about his story and they talked about how <clears throat> and I believe it was him who was he had the role of being the youngest rapper and he he was the rapper Little Fetus. And I think I remember the episode of them having the little rapper Little Fetus. I, I believe I remember that. Because <clears throat> when they said Little Fetus, the rapper, I'm like, that sounds so familiar. Like, I definitely think I remember seeing that episode of him, you know, like, tr like in this bodysuit where he looked like he was nude. It was a flesh tone bodysuit that they made him wear. And he had to, like, look like he was no clothes on with this, you know, flesh tone bodysuit. So he's telling his story, and he's talking about how he had to wear this um, this flesh tone bodysuit, how he was uncomfortable with it. He talked about how his mom started to raise hell at the studios, and she started to feel like there was a lot of things that was inappropriate going on at the studio. So his mom would basically go to different people and kind of complain about some of the environments and some of the things that was going on in the show. So this is his mom right here. And she just was like, wait a minute, like this don't seem right. That don't look right. This seems weird. This ain't right. Like, and she was very boisterous and 
telling her opinion. So at that point in time, her son, I believe he had worked on two seasons of the show. And when he worked on two seasons of the show, his mom, like, as time progressed, she started to realize that things were not right. Okay. And so um, people started to kind of tell her, like, you know, calm it down. Like, you know, like you doing too much or whatever. Like, you know, don't 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 do too much or whatever. And ultimately, her son ended up getting fired from the show. So she talks about how her son got fired and he was not able to go on to season three. And a lot of people felt like it was because the mom was being a little too boisterous about a lot of the things that was going on on the show. And so her son basically talked about how he resented his mom and he had this resentment towards his mom. And it was like a very emotional, like, like, you know, moment in the episode where like the mom start crying, the son, he kind of like was choked up. He was talking about how he had this, you know, disdain or, you know, resentment for his mom because he felt like she ruined his career he didn't really know how to transition from the rejection of not being able to continue on with the show. And the mom talked about how like she didn't even know at the time the house of horrors or stuff that she was basically saving her son from. You know, she was basically saving her son from this house of horrors. She had even no idea. And in the background, it, it caused this strain on her relationship with her son. But now in hindsight, they both see that, you know, she was doing what she needed to do. And she said that anytime any of the people, the executives or the workers of the show or the producers, they seen her son and they would approach her son with caution. And I was like, way to go, mom, you know, because finally a parent who's stepping for their child. So as that episode um, ended, hold on, let me see if I missed out on anything of episode two. I wrote down notes, y'all. Hold on one second. Okay, that was it from episode two, I believe. I don't think there was nothing else. I mean, there was little stuff here and there, but that was like the big the big thing. All right. So episode two, episode two ended, and as episode two was going off, in came Drake Bell. So as the episode goes off, you know, we're getting introduced to this guy by the name of Brian Peck. So also in episode two, they were kind of giving us an introduction into this guy, Brian Peck, and how um, he was known as the pickle guy. You know, like he would have these interactions with celebrities and, you know, they were kind of segueing us into the Drake Bell um, story. So episode three started off and once it started off, it started off with Drake Bell and he was there to tell his story and he was basically saying that this was his first time telling his story that he had not shared his story publicly before that. Now, if you guys don't know who Drake Bell is, he was a star on the Amanda show And he also had his own show called The Drake and Josh Show with him and another co-star by the name of Josh Peck. Now, even though Josh Peck and Brian Peck have the same last name, Josh Peck and Brian Peck are of no relation of each other at all. So I don't really know why people are harassing the Josh guy. I didn't really 
understand that from the um the the documentary but apparently people have been like going in on the josh peck guy so i missed like where he said something or did something where people are going in on him but anyways that's neither here nor there so they um introduced us to drake bell and they talked about how he booked the Amanda show at the age of 12. So they talked about how his father and his mom had this divorce. They weren't they weren't together. And his father kind of wanted his son to kind of, you know, get into the business. So he started out with doing commercials. And then from the commercials, he started to get like a small roles on home improvement and he also had another small role on what was it jerry Maguire, or <clears throat> it was a movie with tom cruise i think anyways so he had got like some small movie roles and then from that he was able to book the amanda show at the age of 12 so he met Brian Peck on the second season of The Amanda Show, and Brian Peck's role was the dialogue coach. So in addition to him being the dialogue coach, he also had a role on the show as well as the pickle guy. So his role on the show would be to give people pickles and they said a lot of his interactions would be with celebrities and they showed one interaction that he had where he gave this guy, I think, who, who was the guy he gave? It's some actor. He looked he looked familiar, but I, don't, I can't think of the name. Y'all gonna be like, girl, you don't know his name? But yeah, he looked familiar. I can't think of the name. But anyways, it, it shows him like giving the actor a pickle and then they like, they like they he serves the pickle through a hole and he gives the guy a pickle through the hole and the guy grabs the pickle and then he starts eating the pickle all like sensually and they start telling us about um Ariana Grande and how there was inappropriate in innuendos with Ariana Grande inappropriate inner innuendos with um the show iCarly, um, inappropriate innuendos with like all these shows. They start talking about all the inappropriate things. Um, I think it was, I think it was the third episode where they talked about how they tried to introduce like this kid, like fear factor. Yeah. The glory hole, but it was, they had their version of the glory hole with, serving the pickle but anyways <clears throat> so anyways so oh i need some water or something i don't know how long this water been sitting oh it's brand new let me drink some water and sorry if i'm all over the place <clears throat> yeah they talked about zoe one-on-one also Sorry if I'm all over the place, but I'm just trying to get out everything that was talked about <laughs> as best as I can. Sometimes I'm horrible with these breakdowns, but hopefully I'm doing okay. Anyways, so while Brian Peck was on the show, Drake Bell and his father met Brian Peck. Brian Peck's role was a dialogue coach. And when he met Drake Bell, he told him and his father that he can get him more roles and more acting jobs. So he ended up convincing Drake's father to allow him to be his acting coach on, on the side and allow Drake to come to his house to give him acting lessons. Drake's father said that he would follow Drake around wherever he went. He was always in eye shot of him. He always was around and he never let Drake Bell out of his sight. If he was shooting a scene, if he went to the acting classes, 
whatever he did, his father was his manager and his father went with him everywhere he went. He said, as time progressed, um, he started to notice that Brian had like a, a, a weird interest in always hanging around his son. Like he would follow his son around set. He would like try to offer to put clothes on him. He said that he would, um, you know, like touch him and like, you know, like times where you like, you don't even need to touch him. Like he would like touch his shoulder or touch his arm or like, and the dad would like notice these weird things about it. And he started to feel uneasy about the relationship between Brian Peck and his son. And so his father started to kind of like make it more difficult for Brian to be around his father. So he said that um, he would um, try to like push Brian away from kind of like, you know, clinging to his son. So I'm going to play one clip from it. And it's when he said that he was also a mentor. The Brian Peck guy was also a mentor to Leonardo DiCaprio. And he said he's seen a video of Leonardo DiCaprio and Brian Peck. And when he seen the video, it kind of reminded him about how like he would touch his son and stuff like that. And how he just did not want his son and Brian to have any dealings together. Like he wanted to protect his son from him at all cost okay so let me um let me see Oops. always keep my eyes on drake and unfortunately i started seeing brian start to just hang around drake too much and it didn't didn't set well with me drake would be in the dressing room or something and in would pop brian and um uh, just touch Drake, you know, do things that, wait a second, what are you doing? Drake can put that on himself. And the thing is, this is in front of people. Then he'd, he'd maybe walk over to Drake and be feeding him some lines or whatever and put his arm around his waist, put his hand up on his shoulder and kind of run it down his arm and things like that. And this would happen routinely. It was just always uncomfortable. Leo, as you know, is the latest, hottest, hunkiest teen idol there is. Yeah, his muscles. I saw this video of Brian Peck on Growing Pains with Leonardo DiCaprio, grabbing his shoulder, running across him, and going down his arm. That's the kind of behavior I saw him with my son. Same frickin' behavior. All right. So he started noticing this behavior and he's like, something is not right here. So after he started observing this behavior, he decided to go to production and tell production how he felt and how he felt like Brian Peck was inappropriate, how he did not like the way that he was touching his son and how he felt like something was going on there. So he goes to production and he, fa he like puts in a complaint to production about it. So as he's complaining to production about how Brian's touching his son, production basically tells him, oh, Brian's gay. And they told the father that he probably has an issue with Brian touching his son because he's probably homophobic. So they wrote off his uncomfortableness of this man and his child, and he's seeing how he's kind of growing this liking to his child that just doesn't feel right. And he goes to production to tell them about it, and they're like, oh, he's gay. And you probably, only reason you probably got an issue with it because you're probably homophobic. And so they start to ostracize his father. And so 
his father said that he started to feel like he was being ostracized and he kind of like backed up a little bit off of it. Like, you know, like backed up off of it. So then, um, they offered him a show. So they offered Drake Bell his own show short, you know, after his father complained about something's weird going on here. Like something's happening here. So they, they offered him a show and they said, you know, um, you know, we're going to offer you your own show. And Brian Peck started to tell Drake that he should not allow his father to be his manager. So Brian started putting seeds in Drake's head that his father was against him. His father was stealing his money. His father was not a good manager. Child stars shouldn't have their parents as their managers. And he even went to Drake's mom about it. So he went to his mom and because the father started to be like, you're not going to be around my child. You're not going to be alone around my child. And the father started making it difficult for him to be, you know, off with his son. He then went to the mom and got into the mom's head because the mom and the father, they didn't get along. They had a divorce. You know, they didn't really have like a good divorce. And the father was in control of the son's career and the father was, you know, managing everything. And so the guy, Brian, went to the mom and told the mom that he's stealing your son's money. He's not a good manager. He's hindering his career. You know, all of these things. So the mom called the father and confronted him about it and said, you know, Drake doesn't want you to be his manager anymore. He doesn't want you to be over his career. He wants you to back off all these things. And his dad was like hurt and devastated. Like I, don't, I got the best interest for my son. Like I wouldn't steal nothing for my son or anything like that. And he said like they went over the finances and seen that he hadn't taken no money. He hadn't did any of those things that they accused him of. But he said, you know what? If this is what my son wants, his father backed off. So once the father backed off, the father signed over all of the bank accounts to the mom. He signed over all the rights to the mom as far as handling Drake Bell's career. And the mom then handed her son over to Brian. And I'm like, B, what? And I mean, I could see how it was easy to play them against each other because they already don't like each other for their own reasons. So she already, you know, whatever happened in their marriage, she already felt like, you know, she didn't really like him. So it didn't take much for her to believe that, oh, well, he probably ain't it sure. He probably, you know what I'm saying, ain't doing right by my son. And didn't believe that the guy that the dad had warned her about was a problem. The father said that he told her, he was like, listen, I'm going to sign over everything to you. I don't mind signing over the bank account. If this is what he wants, this is what he wants. But do not allow Drake to be alone with Brian Peck ever. Do not ever allow them to be alone together and the father says that he was very vehement about that like he was very like clear about that to the mom that he was she was to never allow brian to be alone with her son shortly after everything got transferred over to the mom then after that the mom started to allow him to pick up um, her son. So he said that they live in Orange County and Orange County is like 40 minutes and with traffic, like an hour to LA, but it's really like kind of like 40, 45 minutes from LA. I live, I want to say I live like 40 minutes from, for me to Orange County is like 40 minutes and from Orange County, 
Orange County is going the opposite way from L.A. So, like, for me to go to L.A., say, like, for me to go to L.A. is go this way, right? And then for me to go to Orange County is to go this way. So 40 minutes this way from me, from where I stay is Orange County. And then 40 minutes from Orange County to, you know, get to L.A. So the mom, she didn't really like to travel to L.A. She didn't like to drive. She didn't like to go or anything like that. So... This guy, Brian Peck, the pickle guy. This guy. He starts to tell her he's going to take Brian. He's going to take Drake on auditions. He's going to try to help him get new roles. And he would come up with excuses to get Drake to spend the night. So it started to be routine that he would drive from L.A., pick him up in Orange County, take him to these auditions, and then they would come up with an excuse to where Drake would need to spend the night with him. So while he was spending the night with him, he then started to make a move on him. So he talked about how um, and before before they got to Drake's story, that was something also that I think it was episode two. Hold on, making sure I don't miss that. Hold on. Okay, so yeah, so, um, you know, it. he said after that moment, it severed his relationship with his father. He started being spending the night at, at this guy's house and everything like that. He said that, um, okay, yeah. So he said one time, and before they got to that part, they talked about, and I think this was an episode two, my bad. I, I didn't jot it down. I don't know why. Or did it come later? I don't know. Yeah, I missed I missed the whole chunk. I missed the whole chunk, but I remember it. So anyways, so before they got into talking about Drake Bell and his um, involvement with Brian... There was this other guy who, or this other kid who was on the show as well. And they talked about a time where they had a barbecue. And they were kind of getting us introduced to this Brian character before we got to hear Drake's story. So they were talking about how um, he had invited a lot of the cast members over to his house. And so this was before the whole the whole everything went down with Drake and they start telling us about that. So I'm going to just back up because I forgot to tell y'all this part. And then I'm going to go back to Drake. So anyways, so he had a barbecue at his house. He invited the cast of um, the Amanda show to his house. And when they got to his house, there was one of the kids who described his house as kind of like being kind of creepy. He said that when he got to his house, like uh, Brian was showing them around his house and things like that. And when they were showing him around um, his house, and this is more pictures of the Brian guy, and this is him and Amanda Bynes. Um, <clears throat> when they were going around his house, and this is him and Drake Bell right here. Um, he's right here, and then Drake is up here together. I took a lot of screenshots and I keep on forgetting to insert them, but it is what it is. So I'm sorry if I'm all over the place as well. It's kind of late, but I want to get through this. So anyways, they went to his house and when they went to his house, the guy, the kid, he was a kid, but he's a guy talking to us present day. He talked about how his house was kind of creepy and how in his house he had um, a room that was like 
filled with like nothing but like vintage toys, right? And then in his garage, his garage was the theme of the Planet of the Apes. And everything in his garage was the Planet of the Apes. There was ape this, ape that, everywhere. And so he said it was odd that everything in the garage was the Planet of the Apes. And there was this one picture that stood out that was a picture of a clown. And so the kid goes up to Brian and he's asking him, like, what is this picture? Like, what is this? Because it's obviously not ape theme. It's a clown in a in a picture of a clown in a room that's designed around the planet of the apes. So when he goes and asks him about it, he gets all giddy and he shows them that it was a self portrait that a serial killer had wrote him that that sent to him. So he had became pen pals with a serial killer who was basically killing little boys and killing people. And he started to be a pen pal with him. And the guy had drew him a self portrait of himself as a clown. And he was happy about it. He said that they went into his bedroom and when they went into his bedroom, he was happy and he was telling them about this serial killer that he was friends with and how he had a stack of letters at the side of his bed from the guy. And so this was kind of the introduction that they were giving us into Brian before they started telling us Drake's story. Okay. And so the kid was like, it seemed a little odd, but, you know, I was a kid. So I'm thinking, like, this is a little strange, but I'm a kid. So it's kind of like, you know, everybody else acted like it was no big deal. So <coughs> it was what it was. And, yes, the guy's name is John Wayne Gessie. Guess, guess, as y'all are talking about in the um, chat. So, yes, that is the serial killer that he had this relationship with. So, that was our introduction to this guy. And so, they had given us pictures of him with, um, you know, different people. And they really insinuated it by showing pictures of Amanda Bynes with Dan Schneider and Amanda Bynes with Brian Peck and Amanda Bynes, Amanda Bynes. And they kept like throughout these stories, they would throw in like different things about Amanda Bynes and they would kind of like not say, but say that there was something really sinister that was happening between Amanda Bynes and these people. Now they didn't say it, but they did a lot of in the windows and a lot of suggestive, you know, things where it's like, why is Amanda so jacked up today and what really happened or whatever. So anyways, fast forward back to back to Drake. Sorry about that. I, I, I didn't even jot that whole part down or maybe I missed it, but I, I was trying to be in order here of my notes. So anyways, so back to Drake Bell. So Drake Bell is the kid right at the top that's highlighted. And Brian Peck is the creep that has the turtleneck on down below. So Brian basically draws a, a wedge between Drake and his father. He gets the mom to trust him. He gets the mom to allow him to come over to his house, comes up with reasons for him to spend the night with him. And he says he would sleep on the couch and Brian was sleeping in his room. And one day he was sleeping on the couch and he woke up and it seemed like he started, he was starting to say like he woke up to him giving him head, but he didn't say he woke up to him giving him head. He said he woke up to him as saying him, which in my mind, I took that as he was giving him, you know, Oral. That's kind of what it sounded like, but he didn't say it, but that's what it sounded like. Like he wasn't really very descriptive of things, um, but he kind of said it in a roundabout way. So 
He said that at this time he was sleeping on the couch and he was waking woken up to the pickle guy essaying him on the couch. So when he woke up, he looks, he says that he was in total shock. He froze and he didn't really know like what to do because his dad, you know, already caused a fuss. It was already this commotion. He said he didn't really want to go tell his mom like, oh, I don't want to go over his house anymore. So he said that he decided to not say anything. And he continued to go to his house. And while he was going to his house, he said that the acts that was being done to him got worse and worse and worse. So he said that the worst thing that you can think of somebody doing to somebody, that's kind of what was done to him. So I'm going to play a little clip of it. Hold on. I, 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 at one point, I started to kind of um, <laughs> put timestamps in, but I know that I don't know if this video will get flagged, so I'm not going to put a lot in here. But let's play a little bit. You know, easier to drive me home the next day instead of driving me home and getting me home at midnight or whatever, whatever excuse, you know he came up with, and that's the way it happened uh, for quite a while. He had, he had pretty much worked his way into every aspect of my life. Everything changed with Brian one morning. It's just everything. I knew that everything I knew that my life was going to be absolutely completely different from that point on. I was sleeping on the couch where I would usually sleep and and uh I woke up to him uh I, I just opened my eyes, I woke up, and he was, uh, he was sexually assaulting me. And I froze and was in complete shock and had no idea what to do or how to react. And I have no idea how to get out of the situation. I couldn't run outside, have my, I, I mean, I just, you know, what am I gonna call my mom and be like, hey, this just happened, can you come pick me up? I'll just sit here and wait. I had no car, I didn't drive. I was 15 at this time. And so it just became this, this secret that I had held on to. And uh, it became, you know, I couldn't say I no longer wanted to go to Brian's house because then they're gonna raise questions. Well, why don't you wanna go to Brian's? And then, you know, he's so apologetic. Oh, this will never happen again. I'm so sorry, you know, that I, I don't know what got into me. And, and, and I, I crossed the line, and, I, and this will never happen again. Um, and well, he figured out how to uh, convince my mom and everyone around to have me, you know, anytime I would have an audition or anytime I needed to work on dialogue or anything, I somehow ended up back at Brian's house. And 
it just got worse and worse and worse. And, um, and worse. And, uh, I was just trapped. And I didn't, I had, I had no way out. Y'all, my mom texted me and told me to put my cash app on the screen. <laughs> my mom is like always on it. Shout out to my number one supporter, my mama. She is my number one supporter child. I love her to death. She don't play about me and I don't play about her, period. She said, put your cash app on the screen. This is crazy. I mean, when we, when we talk about stuff like this, especially like stuff that is being done to kids, they don't monetize this kind of stuff because they don't want us talking about these kind of things. So topics like this probably won't. It won't get monetized more than likely. But if y'all want to donate, the stuff is on the screen. But anyway, so listening to that was just like gut-wrenching, okay? So he talked about how he would be apologetic and he would tell him like it wouldn't happen again and things would get worse and worse and worse and worse, okay? It would get worse and worse and worse for him. Now, he talked about how he eventually got a girlfriend. So after this is going on, he's trying to live a normal life. He gets a girlfriend and he decides that, you know, he wants to spend more of his time with his girlfriend. So with this girlfriend, he um, going over to her house. The mom is allowing him to come over and allowing him into, you know, their their life or whatever. So he starts to talk about this one particular day where. Brian Peck wanted to take him to Disneyland. And he didn't want to go to Disneyland with Brian Peck. He didn't want to hang out with him like he wanted to hang out with his girlfriend. So Brian's calling his phone back to back to back to back, calling his phone back to back to back to back to where he doesn't answer the phone. So then he calls his girlfriend's phone and the house phone where the girlfriend lived. And so finally, when he starts calling the girlfriend's phone, they answer the phone. Like, what? Like, why? Like, what's happening? Like, why he keep calling like this? So they, they, they answer. So the mom of the girlfriend saw the, um, the conversation that he had. And so Brian's talking to him on the phone and he's basically telling him like, oh, um, we were supposed to go to Disneyland, what happened, blah, blah, blah. And then um, Drake Bell is basically giving him this excuse and telling him like, oh, you know, I double booked, you know, I'm, I'm hanging out with my girlfriend. Sorry that I told you I would go, but I'm going to hang out with my girlfriend or whatever. And from this, Brian Peck got extremely mad. He got extremely livid that he was blowing him off to hang out with this girlfriend. So Drake hangs up the phone and after he hangs up the phone, Brian starts blowing his phone up again and blowing his phone up again and calling him back to back to back to back again. So his girlfriend's mom is like, why is this grown man calling you like this? This 43 year old man is calling this 15-year-old boy back to back to back tr and pissed off because he doesn't want to go to Disneyland with him. So the mom called Drake in the kitchen and had a conversation with him and was basically like, come here, what's going on? And then he's like, oh, you know, nothing. You know, oh, um, I was supposed to go. And, and the mom's like, no, nah, close the door. 
Come here. What's really going on? And so the mom basically confronted him and she's like, this is not normal. Something is going on. And, you know, trying to get to the bottom of it, like, this is not normal. So Drake kind of gives her some BS excuse of, like, oh, you know, nothing happened. Nothing happened with us. Like, you know, he is kind of acting a little weird, but, you know, nothing happened. It's it's completely nothing, nothing, nothing. So the girlfriend's mom is like, nah, something is happening. Something ain't right. This is a 43-year-old man calling his 15-year-old boy and he's blowing him up because he doesn't want to go to Disneyland? Like, nobody does that. Like, n- no. So he, the girlfriend's mom, called Drake's mom. So she calls his mom and she's like um, telling her what happened. Like, you know, he's blowing up Drake. This isn't normal. Something is wrong. She said, I have a therapist and I'm going to take him to speak to my therapist tomorrow. So the girlfriend's mom, like, if you don't talk to me, I'm going to arrange for you to talk to a therapist, you know, because she felt like, well, if he's not comfortable telling me about what's going on, then maybe he'll be comfortable speaking about this to a therapist. But at the end of the day, we're going to get to the bottom of it. And I was mad that they didn't show who this mom was because I want to be like, kudos, mom. Shout out to you for being a mom. I want to, I'm like, who's the mom? Who's the girlfriend? Like, I really wanted them to show her and I wanted to know who she was just so that I could be like, good job. And go on her comments and say, good job. But they didn't say who the mom was or whatever, so. I mean, whoever was his girlfriend at the time, I'm sure you guys probably could figure out, but I wasn't really a Drake Bell fan like that, so I don't know who it is. So anyways, um, so the mom took him to go see her therapist, and she set up this meeting for him to go talk to the therapist, and the therapist is basically trying to get down to the bottom of it and trying to figure out what's going on with this situation. So as he's talking to the therapist, he's also telling the therapist the same BS story of, um, oh, he's starting to act weird, but nothing has happened. Like he hasn't violated me. He hasn't done nothing to me. And, you know, they kind of have this session that really didn't really go anywhere because he didn't really he didn't tell the um, therapist anything. So time goes on. And as time goes on, it's about to be time for his show, the Drake and Josh show, to start shooting. So at this point in time, he had got offered his own show, but he had not started shooting his own show yet. So it's about to be time for him to start shooting the show and them trying to, you know, get everything together for the show. So as they're trying to gear up and get everything together for the show, Brian Peck is trying to push Drake Bell to push Dan Snyder to put him on the show. He wanted a role on the show as their father. So he wanted to be the father or his father on the show. I don't know if it was because he started to realize, like, this isn't right. And he started to, like, want to be more with his girlfriend. They didn't he, they didn't say this, but I'm just guessing, like, this must have been kind of, like, the feeling about it. Like, you know, I'm kind of into my girlfriend. Like, I don't want you nowhere around me like that. So he says after he was, like, pushing him and trying to, like, get on the show, he said that he felt like, mm-mm. I don't want him no parts of this show, none whatsoever. So he says at that time, he basically called his mom and confessed everything. So he says that he told his mom everything that happened. He told her about him, um, you know, messing with him. He told him about everything that he did. And he just confessed everything to his mom. 
So he said that he came home. And once he came home, his mom called the police. And I'm like, finally, she's being a damn mom. Because when was she ever a mom any other time? Finally, she's being a freaking mom. So the mom calls the cops. And when the mom calls the cops, two police officers come. And he says that when they came to his house, they had like their tape recorders and they were tapping into the phone and, you know, setting it up to where like if he called him, they wanted to get him to confess to what he had did to him. So Drake calls him and he basically tells him that he felt uneasy about what he had did to him. He didn't feel right about it. And Dan, I mean, not Dan, uh, Brian basically confessed everything on the line. So they got everything recorded of him admitting to doing all of these inappropriate things to him. And after they got him to admit everything while they were on the phone, they said that he was basically kept asking Drake, like, is this recorded? Are you recording this call? Is this being recorded? You know, because he kind of knew, like, something was up. So he ends up getting arrested four months after the first guy that I told you guys got arrested. So the first guy that got arrested was the production assistant, which is this guy. This guy, Jason was the first guy who got arrested because he had messed with the nine-year-old girl from Cousin Skeeter and the 11-year-old girl from the Amanda show that guest starred on that show. And it seemed like he was targeting the, the, the kids who were not stars, okay? So kids who had like a little extra role that probably didn't really have much of a career it sound like that's the kind of kids that this guy was going after. So he got arrested first and they kind of didn't really make a big deal about it. So then four months after he got arrested, then the pickle guy, Brian Peck, got arrested. So when he gets arrested, Dan Schneider kind of creates this. Um, they had like this table read where all of the kids were doing their lines and they were reading the script and in came um, some detectives. So Dan Schneider basically goes and he says, um, oh, you know, can all the parents leave out so that our friends can talk to the cast? So the parents left out. And the detectives basically asked the other cast members about if there's any, like, they told him that, you know, he Brian had got arrested. And they asked them, was there anything that they wanted to say, like, anything that they wanted to offer up? And so I believe, like, none of them really had anything to offer up. They didn't really, like, fess up anything. And so the detectives left. So then... Fast forward to um, fast forward to the trial. So nobody knew that the person who had got um, Brian arrested was Drake Bell because he was a minor and they didn't release the name of the minor that got him arrested. So as there was news about him getting arrested, all of the cast was calling around like, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Oh, he got arrested. Da -da. And so cast members was calling Drake Bell. Did you hear what happened to Brian? Did you hear what happened to Brian? And he was like, yeah, I heard. I heard. I heard. I heard. But he wasn't letting any of his cast members know that he was the one who got Brian arrested. He said, but the person that he confided in was Dan Snyder. He said that Dan Snyder called him and he knew that he was probably the one that got Brian arrested. 
And he said that, um, I'm sorry, y'all. <clears throat> he said that, um, and thank you for the people who complimented me on my hair. This is my first time trying, um, kinky straight texture. Normally I do like the straight, straight, like the bone straight texture, but this is my first time doing like the kinky straight texture where it's a little bit more puffier or whatever and it's supposed to like look more realistic or whatever but anyways thank you i see y'all um comments in the chat i appreciate that so anyways <clears throat> where was i at where was i where was i at Oh, okay, so all of the people was calling Drake and they were basically um asking him, did he know did he know that um that Brian had got arrested? So, he wasn't telling anybody that it was him that got Brian arrested or whatever like that. So, Dan Schneider called him and was like um, did you know about Brian getting arrested? Was it you? And Drake Bell confessed to Dan Schneider that it was in fact him that got uh, Brian arrested. And he said that out of the Nickelodeon franchise, that Dan Schneider was the only person that reached out to him and kind of like comforted him and gave him support throughout that time. And Dan Snyder did not write a character letter for Brian in that time. So fast forward to the trial. So he says that, you know, back in this time when he took it to trial, it wasn't like, you know, how there was TMZ now and, you know, us YouTubers and other journalists like following these court proceedings where so it stayed under wraps that nobody knew that it was him but the people who went to the court. He said that when he went to court, it was him, his mom, and his brother in the courtroom going against Brian Peck. And on their side, it was just them. He said on the side of support for Brian, thank you uh, for the uh, super chat, for the support of Brian, it was all of these Hollywood producers, all of these Hollywood, you know, actors. He had a gallery of people that were filled in support of him, even though he had these charges that he had. It was 11 charges. What was the charges? Hold on. He had 11 charges. And they consisted of, where did I write it down? Child. Where did I write down the charges? Okay, here we go. Okay. He had 11 charges of SA. And some of the charges included sodomy, forcible penetration, using foreign objects, employment of a minor for corn, Oral copulation with a minor and so many more. So sodomy and using foreign objects mean that you're pushing objects in somebody. Forcible penetration. All of these things are his charges. And he had 41 people give him character letters 40 
one people give him character letters. And of the 41 people who gave him support character letters, there was Hollywood actors, there was Hollywood directors, producers, there was Robin Thicke's daddy, Alan Thicke, who gave a support letter to him. And in a lot of the letters of people that had wrote character letters for him, many of the letters said that he must have been tempted. The boy must have forced himself on him and he must have forcibly tempted this grown man to sodomize him and do these acts on him. So, <clears throat> this is one of the screenshots that they posted up on the screen. Let me see. Did I put a timestamp for the character letters? I'll probably show y'all a quick clip of the character letters, but I took screenshots of everybody who's, who they highlighted that gave a character letter. So this right here is Alan Thicke. And they highlighted that Alan Thicke, who's resting in peace, who's Robin Thicke's dad, gave a character letter in support of Brian Peck. And they put a side-by-side -side of, you know, uh, they kind of glanced by it very quickly. And he talked about how he worked with him daily in 1987 that he's a nurturing mentor of young people. Um, <clears throat> I guess he never was inappropriate in any way around children. <clears throat> it's saddened to learn the trouble he was in. Um, something about he knows that he, he's remorseful and how he's dedicated and focused. Integrity and self-respect have always been important. It's mortif mortifying to him in ways that will only make him, I don't know, it cut off. And I am convinced that Brian will make a second chance and people who have known him hold him in high regard. So they flashed some of the, the letters on the screen, so I didn't get to see everything that they, that, that they said. But I think um, this was Alan's letter. Hold on, wait, because I think I screenshotted this one. Hold on. This was right before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Alan's, this is Alan's letter. I, sc I, I screenshotted this one. <laughs> I screenshotted this one because I wanted to read it with y'all. Um, So this is what Alan Thick said. I'm writing to express my um es estimation of Brian Peck as an honorable, respectable, intelligent human being who apparently made a, gi a gigantic mistake which will have him, well, which will hunt him for life. I am honored to be uh, regularly included in list of America's favorite TV dads, an identity that I proudly carry throughout the country in writing about and lecturing to families on issues of parental concern. I am regarded as a published authority in this genre. And because I take that image and its responsibility very seriously, I would obviously be very careful about character reference relating to children. I worked with Brian Peck daily from 1987 through 1991 and found him to be highly professional and nurturing mentor of young people on our television set because he was never inappropriate in any way around children, including my own two young sons. I was shocked and saddened to learn the, of the trouble he was in. Knowing him as I did, I also know beyond a doubt 
how remorseful he is and how dedicated and focused he will be on his rehabilitation. Brian's integrity and self-respect have always been important to him. And this turn of events has been mortifying to him in ways that he will only make that will only make him a better, stronger citizen in the future. I am convinced Brian will make a second chance. Um, a second chance lasts a lifetime. And I trust you will consider the people who have known him and hold him in high regard when you contemplate his punishment. So they they was putting the letters click quick, but I made sure to go back because Alan Thick is one of the ones that I recognize. Like I know Alan Thick, I know Robin Thick, you know, I know who they are. A lot of the other people that they named, I didn't really know who they were. Some of them were actors, some of them were directors. I didn't really know who they were, but I specifically made sure to like, <laughs> you know, um, get his. So some of the other people who made character letters included this guy right here. He looks familiar. I don't. I did he did he act in American Pie? He looks familiar. Oh, he was recently in that um that uh, reality show um Jury Duty, and I liked him in Jury Duty. I liked him in Jury Duty. Sad, unfortunate. Anyways, so James Mars Marsden. Um, he, he recently was in a reality show. I think it was on Amazon prime called, um, it was called jury duty. It was really good. I, I really liked it. I really did like it a lot. Um, he was in it and he was playing himself and they talked about how like he was in American pie and all of these other shows and stuff like that. So anyways, James Marston, he wrote a support letter as well. Um, I didn't I didn't slow up the screen to like get the whole letter, but he wrote a letter. Um who's this? Hold on. Taryn Killian. I guess this was also an actor. I don't know who he is. But he wrote a letter. Um who else wrote a letter? Uh, who's this? Ron Melendez wrote a letter in support of him. Okay. Uh, who else wrote a letter? They just highlighted certain people. This guy right here. Ryder Strong wrote a letter in support of Brian Peck. Uh, who's this? Will Freddy? Friday? I think I think they said he was the actor too. I don't know all these people. Some of y'all may know these people. I don't know all these people. Um, who's this? This woman wrote a letter. Kimmy Robertson. She wrote a letter. And she was one of the ones who, who was like, oh, they must have tempted him. They must have, uh... They must have, uh, y'all said he was on Boy Meets World. Oh, okay. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't. Child, I watched Boy Meets World too. I did watch that show. I definitely did. And I did not recognize him right off the bat. So this is a part of her letter that I, I screenshotted her letter. Cause I'm like, bimbo, what?
So this is what that bimbo said. She said, I believe with all my heart that Brian was pressured and pushed beyond belief before he caved in. He was pressured to sodomize a child, a minor. What, girl? What, Kimmy? And there was several of them who made these accusations that the guy must have pressured him to do it. They talked about this guy right here. I believe he is a him and his wife. So this guy right here, Rich Carell, he was the director over The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. Okay? So The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody, I believe that was, was that on Nickelodeon or was that on Disney? I think it might have been on, I think The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody was on Disney. Anyways, this guy right here, he wrote a, a character letter and his wife also, this girl right here, these two wrote a character letter. She is Beth Carell and Rich Carell. They both wrote a character letter for him and they both talked about how he was a pleasure to work with and how um, they would love to hire him in the future. So he gets found guilty. They have 41 character letters from these producers, actors, all of these elites in the show business. And Drake and his mom are there. And Drake says that his mom gave a statement and she spoke to everybody. And then after his mom spoke, he said that he spoke. And he said that his response to the court was to direct it to the people that was in support of Brian Peck. And he talked about how, how, these people were supporting him and how he had to live with this and he had to live with the fact that the, these people are behind him supporting this crap. So Brian Peck ended up getting sentenced to 16 months in jail. And after he got sentenced to 16 months, was it 16 months probation or 16 months in jail? Hold on. Let me refer to my notes, child. Because I wrote it down. Okay. He was, he was sentenced to 16 months in jail, <coughs> and he had to register as a SO. Okay? And so after he got um, sentenced to 16 months in jail... He found guilty of doing this to this boy. I'm sure in court they played the, like the way that court goes, if the cops had a tape, I'm sure they heard the tape of him confessing to doing this. So the director, Rich Carell, and his wife, ended up hiring him, Brian Peck, to work on The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. After he was found guilty of 
doing all of this stuff to Drake Bell. Now, the documentary reached out to them for comment, and they're claiming that they had nothing to do with who got hired on the show. But I find it weird that y'all saying that y'all didn't have nothing to do with who got hired on Sweet Life of Zach and Cody, but in your character letters, you specifically pointed out the fact that you would hire him in the future, and in the future, he suddenly starts working on the show that you guys are the directors and producers of. But y'all claim y'all didn't have nothing to do with him getting hired. Get out of here with that. I don't believe that for one second. Get out of here with that. Save that drama for your mama. Please. So... Who else wrote a letter that I didn't? Um, who is it? Did I show this lady already? Who this is? Joanna Kern. They only highlighted certain people. They didn't highlight everybody. So it was only certain ones that they highlighted that, that sent a letter. So... This is the statement that they gave. They're going to say they had no input in the involvement in casting Brian Peck on the Disney show. Save that drama for your mama. I don't believe that crap. Please save it. They said talking about they said when they asked him about the case Mr. Peck simply replied that the problem had been resolved how it been resolved how was it resolved and y'all said okay well it's been resolved even though you just had to serve 16 months in jail register as the SO But yeah, it's been resolved. Let's put you around more children. And more specifically, let's put you around another show centered around young boys. Get out of here. Oh, 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 he told he told us the matter had been resolved. Get, get out of here with that. Get out of here with that. Get out of here with that. I don't even know why they sent in a comment. They was better off no comment. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You put in your character letter that you wanted to hire him in the future, and he got hired on a show that you're directing and producing in the freaking future. Talking about, oh, we didn't have nothing to do with the hiring product process, and he told us the matter had been resolved. Get out of here with that. Get out of here with that. So then they talk about um, Dan Schneider. So then it goes to episode four. And so when they start episode four, they talk about how these three men were charged with doing acts on children while working um, for Nickelodeon. The left is the guy Jason, in the middle is Brian, and then the far right is I didn't catch his name. It was something I don't I don't I forget what his name was. It was some some I don't know what his name was. It was something. It was they kept saying his name and it was and I'm like, "Huh? What's his name?" And then I went to go try to write it down and they would say his name and it was like, blah, blah. "I'm like, what is his name?" I said, "I'm not even going to try to write it down. It was something." It was something. So anyways, these situations happened in 2003. The two on the left got arrested in 2003. The one on the right got arrested in 2005. So in 2005, the dude on the right with the glasses, his name is Blue. I don't even know what his name is. He was a freelance worker on the set. And he wasn't like, um, 
he wasn't like contracted through Nickelodeon, but he was like freelance through like subcontractor or something like that. Something like that with him. So anyways, he had messed with a young boy and he brought him to the Nickelodeon set. He brought the boy to the set to fondle him on the set or something like that. And he got arrested or whatever. And then after that, Nickelodeon claims that they did a, uh, they started doing background checks. Okay. So then they started to do these extensive background checks on people and they started doing more background checks. So episode four, um, it, it basically started out, it started out with the sentencing. They told us about the character letters. They told us about how Brian was um, hired again after that and how Walt Disney started to come under fire because people noticed that it was a child pred working on their show. And so people started to like come at Disney for having this guy working on the show that violated a kid. Now, all the while, they had no idea that this guy was Brian Peck. So Drake Bell, he talks about before before the guy gets hired onto Disney, he talks about how he goes he goes and he goes to court. He does his victim impact statement. Um, Brian Peck is um, sent to jail for 16 months. And a few weeks later, he's the star of Drake and Josh. And the show just went on. He talked about how he had to break it to his dad. And, you know, he called his father. And his father, he had a conversation with him. And... He basically told his dad, like, you know, hey, dad, uh, Brian got arrested. He, you know, and he told his dad what he got arrested for. And it sounded like he didn't admit to his dad right away, like, that something happened. Because his dad wasn't there in court with him. When he named the people that was in court with him, he didn't name his dad. He said it was his mom, his brother, and him. He didn't, I don't remember him naming his dad. So he ended up calling his dad and telling his dad about it because they had a strained relationship at that time. Brian had drove a wedge between him and his father's relationship. And so he called his dad and when he's telling his dad, he's like, oh, dad, you know, he got arrested. Hold on. Let me let me see if I could find the timestamp. Let me see if I could find the timestamp. Hold on. That's episode four. Let me go to episode four. Hold on. One second. Because it don't sound like he told his dad right away. I worked in the wardrobe department. Some of these seem pretty innocuous where it's... Convicted of abusing that child on the lot. He actually had prior convictions as a sex offender, and Nickelodeon didn't catch it. Jason Michael Handy. Brian Peck. And then Izell Channel. Oh, Izell Channel. So that was the thing with him. So basically, he had prior, um, the, the black dude that got hired, he had prior um, SO, uh, SA situation, and... He didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't catch it. But hold on, I'm trying to find, hold on, I'm trying to find where he tell his dad about it. Me, my mom, and my brother. Brian had been convicted. Yeah, see, his dad wasn't there. His entire side of the courtroom was full. 
full. There were definitely some recognizable faces on that side of the room. And my side was uh, me, my mom, and my brother. Brian had been convicted, but getting all of this support from a lot of people in the industry, and yeah, I was pretty shocked. My mom got up, she had a statement. I wasn't going to address Brian. There was no, no reason to. I addressed my statement to everyone in the room. I looked at all of them. And I just said, how dare you? And I said, you will forever have the memory of sitting in this courtroom and defending this person. And I will forever have the memory of the person you're defending violating me and doing unspeakable acts and crimes. And that's what I'll remember. Hold on, I'm trying to find where his dad, um, where he told his dad about it. Maybe that was episode three. Hold on one second. I'm going through it right now. <clears throat> Hold on, y'all. I want to get the part where he tells his dad. Then they get worse. They don't have childhoods like kids are supposed to have were uh, happening because I was I, 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 I was lost Nickelodeon's Drake Bell is arrested in California okay I'm gonna get to that part in a second hold on I think it must have been episode three then hold on one second let me go back They arrested him for a molestation. I go, you're kidding. You don't need to talk anymore about it. That's all I needed to hear. Are you okay? You know, do you need anything from me? Is there anything that you need? Brian was spending so much time around me that it was pretty obvious. calling his dad now i get a phone call from drake i go what's up i haven't heard from you for a while and i was like oh did you see they got him i go what do you mean brian they they arrested him and drake says they arrested him for a molestation i go you're kidding i knew it i knew it and my dad just goes i am so glad that he was not able to get his hands on you my dad's very emotional and I just, we were starting to rekindle our relationship and I just couldn't. So I just said, yeah, they, you know, they got him. He's like, oh, I'm so glad. I knew he was gonna do something to someone. How did it make you feel when you finally found out? I was, are you kidding? I'm, I'm not, I'm not the same today. The pain's still there from the moment that I knew. It's just a, I don't wish this on any parent or child whatsoever. It's <sighs> so anyway, so fast forward, that was episode three. Fast forward to episode four. Um, they start segueing back into talking about Dan Schneider. 
They start talking about the work environment that he did. They start talking about, um, what's her name? McCritter? Jenny? What's her name? I started getting tuned out at towards the end of episode four because I was kind of like, Ugh. So they start talking about how he, in 2014, Dan Schneider got a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um... They started talking about Jenny McCurdy, and she was on the show uh, Sam and Cat with um, Ariana Grande, and they talked about how she basically made a memoir, and in her memoir, a lot of people think that she is talking about Dan Schneider because she talks about um, a producer being abusive and talked about how she was treated. So Jenny is the one on the left and Ariana Grande is the one on the right. Dan Schneider is the one in the middle. And she basically talked about how, you know, she felt like he was a piece of, or she, she talked about a producer. She didn't name names. She talked about how it was this bad environment. It was an abusive environment. It made her feel a certain type of way. And she didn't really name who he was. So people like got this memoir. They started reading about it. And a lot of people thought that she was talking about Dan Schneider because he was the curator of the show. And the person that she described in her memoir was the producer of the cure and the curator of the show. So it's like ding ding ding. She's talking about Dan Snyder. And it is what it is. She went on several podcasts. She talked about the climate of her working at um, Nickelodeon and all of those things. They talked about him getting his Lifetime Achievement Award. Then they had this costume director. And she didn't really show who her face. And they talked about how this woman was working on costume. And then they talked about how... Dan Snyder would call people from like different departments to come like um, massage him. And so like even if they were like busy with other tasks, like he would get other people to like massage him while he was on set and stuff like that. They talked about how this costume, I think she was like a costume director, a costume person. She was in charge of wardrobe, costume, whatever. She basically ended up... Um, then they start talking about the Me Too movement. So the Me Too movement happened. All these women were coming forward. They were talking about, you know, the industry, all these things that happened against them. So this woman who was this costume person, she filed a complaint on Dan Snyder. And she basically talked about how... um he was how he acted and things like that. When she filed a complaint against him to, I forget who she filed a complaint to. I don't know if it was, it was some, I think it was Nickelodeon. It was somebody. She filed a complaint to them. And when she filed a complaint to them, they basically told her that they had several other complaints from other women. So she wasn't the only one to file a complaint. There were several other complaints that they had on Dan Snyder. So after she filed a complaint, there was an investigation that was launched into Dan Snyder. So there was this investigation that was launched and he basically still worked on the show. But the conclusion of it was that he could not have interactions with the cast like you know like his little intimate interactions where they're massaging him or like anything outside of his direct duties like he did not have interactions with them like he could not interact with the people on his show like they said that he was pushed out of the writer's room and then like he kept getting pushed like out of different roles that he had eventually in two, 20, 2018 after he continued to be on the show, even after like these like complaints or whatever, there started to be, um, I guess more complaints. And then he got offered a settlement to leave. So he got offered $7 million to leave the show. So, um, 
He left in 2018, and he has not been a part of Nickelodeon since then. He was fired, and that kind of was all, all she wrote for from him. Now, he gave a statement at the end of the um, thing, and so this is what his statement said. It says, Dan Snyder says, everything that happened on the show I ran was carefully scrutinized by dozens of in involved adults. All stories, dialogue, costumes, and makeup were fully approved by the network executives on two coasts. A standards and practice group read and ultimately approved every script and programming executives review reviewed and approved all episodes. In addition, every day on every set, there were always parents and caregivers and their friends watching us rehearse and film. Now, in addition to him giving that statement that they showed on the documentary, um, Nickelodeon also gave us, they also showed this statement that was from Nickelodeon, and they basically showed this statement after every episode. So after every episode would go off, they would flash this up on the screen and it would say in, pro in response to producers questions, Nickelodeon has stated invest it, it investigates all formal complaints as part of our commitment to foster in a safe and professional workplace. We have um, adopted numerous safeguards over the years to help ensure we are living up to our own high standards and expectations of our audience. So that was kind of like the little um, disclaimer that they would put from Nickelodeon after every episode that they talked about this. Now, in addition to that, Dan Snyder also made, um, I think he did an interview. I think it was posted on the Shade Room. So hold on, let me go to it and show you guys because um, he spoke out since this. I think I've seen it on the Shade Room. So I don't have it queued up, but it shouldn't be that far down because I don't believe it was that long ago. So let me pull this up. In addition to Dan Snyder making comments, um, there was a mom who also made comments. So hold on. Let me show you guys the response from some of the people. Hold on one second. So this is an interview that he did, and so let me pull it up. Um, I guess I guessed it uh, two times on Victoria's. Didn't like Dan. Haven't been able to watch the doc yet. Being easy to work with leaves these kids and parents so susceptible. Um, you guessed appeared on on Victoria's two times. Is that what you're saying, Tanel? Thank you for the super chat. Hold on. Let me. And hopefully I'm explaining what was in the documentary well enough. I know I'm kind of all over the place, but I just kind of wanted to get through it. I know I, I probably didn't give the best. Um, I don't know if I gave the best breakdown. It, hopefully y'all was able to rock with me and, 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 and get, you know, get through it. But. So this is um, Dan basically speaking out about the allegations, and this is what they said. Please discuss child predators. Now, I want to make sure that we clear a couple of things up. Okay. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake... And I talked, and he told me what had happened. I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. 
a lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. This series discussed. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency, and they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree, mm -hmm. and they still did this. It's, just, it's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah. And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech with the judge? And I said, of course, and I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah. And, and even more disappointing, but he wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these all. We're a Fear Factor, sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give them to the network, and then they would say, one, tell us the ones that were okay. Right. Those are the ones we shot, those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period, the end. Right. And if I had known at the time I would, I would have changed it. But he wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious and sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it made me feel awful and regretful and sorry. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that I have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an asshole to anyone ever. Um, look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that, but if I could go back, I would get it done in different ways. I I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky. All right. Um. <clears throat> so that's what he had to say. And, you know, it made the blogs that, you know, Drake Bell revealed that, you know, these things happened to him when he was 15 years old. Drake also spoke out. Because apparently people were being hard on his co-star, Josh Peck, which I really still don't understand. I didn't understand the con the context of why people were going hard on Josh Peck when he has no relation to Brian Peck. So I was kind of lost there. If y'all could fill me in in the comments, I really don't know where, like why he came forward, but he was basically telling people to take it easy on Josh but it's like if Josh was a child, just like he was a child, what do people expect Josh to do? Like, what did, what, what, why are people bothering another person that was also a minor at the time? I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm missing that part, but let me play it. Hey, what's up, guys? I just want to uh, clear something up. Um, I've noticed. A lot of uh, comments on on some of Josh's TikToks and some of his posts, and I just want to let you guys know that um, this is really, uh, you know, processing this and going through this is a really emotional time, and um, a lot of it's very, very difficult. Uh, so not everything is 
put out to the public, um, but I just want you guys to know that he has reached out to me and um, it's it's been very uh, sensitive, um, but he has reached out to, uh, uh, to talk with me and, and help me work through this and, and uh, has been really, really great. So I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that and to uh, take it a little easy on him. If I haven't talked to you since 2023, take that as a f***ing sign that you don't exist to me anymore. Damn, bug. You got sprayed with the raid. Bye. See you in that bar. If I haven't talked to you since... And so people took this TikTok as him caping for him, but I don't... I don't see how he's being this dorky white guy saying if I haven't talked to you since 2023... I'm then you've been sprayed with the raid. I don't see, I don't, I don't, maybe I'm being re slow, but I don't see how that's caping for him. Like this is what they're pulling up as a reference and it's not saying, I mean, I don't see it, but again, I'm maybe I'm missing something. 2023, take that as a sign that you don't exist to me anymore. Damn, bug, you got sprayed with the raid. All right, so people were coming at him and saying that your spy, your silence speaks volumes. Is given um, Dan Schneider core, bro took the three hundred k. Your silence is loud, brother. Sigh, Josh, you disappointed us. I thought this was Chris Olsen. The timing with this is odd. Your silence is loud, brother. He is Dan Schneider's minion. He took a lot of notes. Were you ever um, a truther, Josh? Justice for Drake. In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And my whole thing about it, it's not his place to speak for him. It's not his place to speak up for Drake. If Drake is speaking up for himself, Drake is supposed to speak up for himself. He was also a teenager at the time. Like, what do y'all want him to say? Like, if he didn't have the same experience, there are literally people who will prey on certain kids and don't prey on other kids. I feel like people, they get emotionally invested into these type of stories and they want everybody to say, oh, I I had a weird encounter with this person or everybody doesn't have the same encounter. They don't. I don't I don't know what they feel like that he's supposed to do or what he's supposed to say. I think that I, I would rather him not say anything than say something that was silly or or whatever. Like you're mad because he's not speaking out about a situation that is not his to speak out. And if he was violated and he's choosing not to speak out about it, that's also his right too. So again, I don't understand why people are really going towards him or going at him. It doesn't really make sense to me. Um, it's not his place to speak if he doesn't want to speak. That's just how I feel about it. If you feel like everybody has to speak, that's you. But I don't feel like he has to publicly tell you guys how he feels about something for it to for you to know that it's wrong. We all know that what Brian Peck did was wrong. We all know that Brian Peck should have got way more than 16 months in jail. And it shows how corrupt the system really is and how there was high people in place that solidified him to have an easy blow to this. We know that. Like, we, like I don't need Josh to say that. I don't need Josh to speak up and speak about that. Like, Drake is brave. Drake is strong. And um, you said Josh was actively defending the uh, Preds. He dismissed Jeanette's claims a few years ago, and now he's being messy. Well, I didn't I didn't see all of that. I only I don't keep up with um them. I didn't I wasn't a fan of the show. So if that's what he did, then I take your word for it. Then he was wrong for defending them if he did defend them. You know? But off of the TikTok that was shown to me, 
I didn't really see nothing that he did wrong. But if he was defending him, then I digress and I take back what I said because he shouldn't be defending him. But him making a TikTok, I don't take that as him being messy. That's y'all looking for answers and looking for him to say something. And he chose to do a TikTok. Like, I don't I don't really look at his TikTok as being messy. That's just my opinion. But I also don't have the information of what he said defending nobody either because the shade room didn't post it. Because I don't really keep up with um what he got going on. So, anyways, um, that's that on that. Um, what else? There was oh, uh the mom. The mom that came forward. Um is it Carl or Charles Macy? Hold on, let me find her. Hold on, I think I think I seen her on the neighborhood talk. Dang, was it really that far down? Oh, here we go. Chris Macy. Child, I don't know these people's names like that. I didn't really watch um all of the Disney shows for real, for real. Like, I'm familiar with Chris. I know who he is. I've seen him work before, but I didn't really watch. So, in light of everything that was happening with the documentary, Chris, Messi's mom, she decided to post a post saying how awesome uh, Dan Schneider was. So, everybody in the documentary is talking about how horrible of a person he is, how the environment was toxic, and how the environment was this. And then you even had Dan Schneider who apologized for his actions while he was on the show and how he treated people. And he said that he was rude, obnoxious, and he basically admitted to being not a nice person and being, uh, you know, a horrible person to work with. In light of all of that, Chris Mama decided to post on her post and say, Dan Schneider, you are awesome. And she showed a picture of him getting his lifetime. I think this is when he got his Lifetime Achievement Award with her son standing next to him. And she said, Don Schneider, you are awesome. You are a genius. I can't thank this guy enough for the opportunity he gave my son and my family. And then she put, blame the parents. My opinion is, 1,000 as it relates to what my opinion and experiences as it relates to this situation. Swipe and smile. Angel Massey, the fact addict. Okay? And so that's what she posted on her page. And a lot of people wasn't feeling it. A lot of people was not feeling the fact that she up here praising this man that everybody is talking about how he violated these different people. So then she goes and she decides to uh, double down on her opinion. And this is what she had to say. Never done anything to us. And when I said that it was the parents' fault, who allows their children to get a ride with, with a staff member to work? Who allows their children to spend the night with staff members? That's what I was talking about. So for when all these people are Instagramming me and saying all these things about me, I have really tough skin. And uh, and yeah, I have tough skin. 
And that don't bother me. I don't give a shit about what they're talking about, about accusing me of stuff that they don't know. These people have been attacking me all day long on Instagram, the very place that claims that they have community guidelines, talking all this stuff about me and saying and basically being prejudiced because I and the and the comments are because Dan Snyder is white, that I'm not supposed to be um, I'm not supposed to be supportive of him. Well, the world is is a diverse place. Um, when you go to the hospital, it's white people, it's black people, it's other ethnicities. I'm not racist. I'm not ignorant. I, I never done anything to us and come from a very high character family, which I think is super interesting how people's brains work and how easily somebody can be brainwashed. And when I use the word brainwashed from my definition of brainwashed, meaning that you can jump on a bandwagon and we, and if you watch television, you know the power of editing. And I still stand by what I said, the people, you have to be mindful of the people that bring things to other people because I still stand by what I said in the post, so just read them. And um, and I'm not, I didn't watch the documentary and I have no plans on watching the documentary because I want to remember Dan Snyder as the person that he was to us. We had an exemplary ride with um, Nickelodeon. We had an exemplary ride with Dan Snyder and I am not a bandwagon person, I'm for what's right. I come from a very high character family, which I think, um, and just because he's white, I'm not gonna turn my back on him. And just because he's no longer with the net, with that particular network, I'm not gonna turn my back on him. Um, and that's that's my experience with him. My experience, my personal experience, Angel Massey's experience with him has been nothing but exemplary. The man is a genius. Um, and and for, for the people that are not familiar with, television he is right when he said in his answer that there are so many levels of vetting that every television show has to go through so for one person to be have to take the fall for something i don't think that that's fair and um i agree with her on that part um for me i wouldn't have jumped out the window for for dan uh like that i would have just you know it is what it is i mean she ain't really in the limelight like that. So I don't think that people was checking for what she had to say. Maybe they were, maybe they were not. But that particular part, I agree with her on the fact that it was not just him. And we've seen the fact that there was 41 people in the business that wrote character letters. And there was a lot of people that, you know, this show, in order for it to get put on, had to go through and there was a lot of people on those sets that can also be held accountable and Nickelodeon needs a lot of blame as well the people who are higher above Dan Snyder hold blame the people who are above the people above that person hold blame there is a lot of people who also hold accountability in it and I agree with her that it's not just Dan but what I won't act like that it's not Dan included because Dan is included, but included with him is all of the other people because he admitted to it. So we can't act like he's excluded from this and he has no culpability in the treatment and the atmosphere that was put on in there because he admitted to it. So we can hold him accountable because he admitted to it. So we're not going to act like he was this, pristine guy and like that he was this this he admitted to the bullshit that he was doing okay but in addition to him i agree with the point that he's not the only one to be held accountable i agree with that but we're not gonna act like he's not to be held accountable yeah so that's all um, and just because he's white, I'm not going to turn my back on him. And just because he's no longer with the net with that particular network, I'm not going to turn my back on him. Um, and that's that's my experience with him. My experience, my personal experience, Angel Massey's experience with him has been nothing but exemplary. The man is a genius. Um, and and for for the people that are not familiar with television, he is right when he said. And my yeah, whole I come thing from about it too, like if I'm a parent, the allegations of this whole situation is misconduct with minors. You are a whole mother 
defending Dan Snyder on behalf of your child who has allegations of inappropriate behavior with underage girls. So I wouldn't even feel right as a parent who my child that I'm defend that I'm jumping out the window saying we had exemplary um feelings. Like I would instead of jumping on Instagram, I would be calling my son and being like, son, I know that things seem to be going well over there, but is there something that you didn't tell me? Cause I can't be everywhere all the time. Cause even though she's talking about how, oh, the parents shouldn't have let the kids sleep over, she right about it. But there's also a factor that there was misconduct happening on set as well. There was literally another guy who got arrested for having misconduct on the set and on the lot. So instead of jumping out the window saying, oh, he was exemplary to me and all this stuff, I would be calling my son who recently had dealings with the law in inappropriate behavior with chill with people who he had no dealings with. I, I forget if the girl was a minor or if, if he tried to take the cookie box or I forget what what did he what 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 did he get in trouble for? Hold on. Chris Massey Minor. Let me see. Wait. He was arrested for domestic violence. Oh, I think it was Kyle Massey with the um the underage girl. I don't think it was Chris. Hold on. I think it was Kyle Massey with the minor. Hold on, let me see if it was Kyle. It was Kyle. So her son Kyle he was supposed to have misconduct with the minor. And then Chris, her son, Chris, had domestic violence. He was arrested for domestic violence, um, of fighting his girlfriend in Las Vegas. So if I had a son that was accused of misconduct and my other son had this stuff going on, I would be asking my sons, is there something that happened that mommy didn't know about? Cause you know, even if you feel like you know everything that happened around the Nickelodeon set, kids are liars sometimes. Sometimes kids will lie to you and say, I'm going over Susan's house and really be going over Jacob, the, the executive's house or whatever. So instead of, um, you sitting here acting like you just know about, you know, this guy and all this stuff jumping out the window. Like I would be having conversations with my kids about what's really going on. And even though um, his brother was on That's So Raven, that doesn't mean that he didn't have um, interactions with these people because most of the, pe the people that got arrested, they had dealings with people who was one offs on the set. The guy, Jason, he had dealings with people who simply was guest stars and just appeared one time and he cultivated things with them. So just because Kyle was on Disney and his brother was on Nickelodeon, that doesn't mean that he didn't cross paths because I'm sure they're brothers. He came to set at one point in time and cross paths. So with that being said and that being known, I would be asking my sons, is there anything that I don't know before I jump out the window like that? So anyways, she jumped out the window and she was basically saying all of that. And her son decided to give his own statement and say that she can't speak for him. So he ended up speaking out and this is what he had to say. Hold on, let me.
do that. Okay, this is what he had to say. He said, hold on. All right. So this is what he said. He said, um, my story will be told from me, not from a parent, a friend, a coworker, me and only me. So please stop messaging me about what my mom said respectfully. So he basically told y'all pipe down. Okay. Stop coming to me. Talk about what my mama talk about because she can't speak for me. Only I can speak for me. And she can't tell my experience better than I could tell my experience. And that was that. So that was basically the whole rundown and shebang of the whole shebang. Um, I just wanted to do a full breakdown. I may have missed out a couple of parts, but I tried to hit on the key things that they talked about in the documentary. They talked about other, like there was kind of like one-off stories that they would kind of like, segue in and talk about certain things. I didn't talk about every single detail that they talked about in the four part documentary. I just talked about the main key big things that I kind of felt like, Oh wow. Like this is crazy. <laughs> y'all let me know what y'all think about it. If you guys watch the documentary, um, y'all let me know and we'll talk about it down below. Hopefully I was able to, um, detail everything if y'all want to donate to my page y'all know y'all can because baby these type of stories are not um these type of stories are not monetized and if y'all you know like me doing breakdowns of stuff like this or whatever like that Y'all know that y'all can always support by going to my website or going to my cash app. And you can support for free also by just hitting like to it. Like the video, share the video, drop some comments. You know, it's not required for y'all to donate monetarily, but it does help. All right. So with that being said, thank you so much. Um... Thank you, Tanel. Thank you, Black Skies. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you, Shakir. Um, true, true. Let me see who else is still here. Diana, Abundance, and Clarity. It's a lot of y'all still rocking with me. I've been on here for two hours. Junior, Ashley, Reese, Santi, Sha, One, Rogers, uh, T, Red Aries, uh, let's see, Kyle, Alexander. Antoine Grady, Antoine Grady, fly high. Uh, let's see. It's a lot of y'all. Thank y'all so much for watching. JRB, um, thank y'all for watching. Really, what's up, Tommy? What's up? Um, Tommy said thank you for the breakdown, Nick. I was a child watching some of these shows and missed the actual meaning of the jokes. Yeah, like I honestly. When they were talking about all of the inappropriate things that was happening on the show, I was trying to think back, like, as a child, did I notice that these things were, like, wrong? Or because at the same time, like, you being a, a child or you being in middle school, like, there was suggestive things that people were saying, like, on the playground. And there was suggestive things that people were saying, like, you know, like between like your friends and stuff like that. So I don't know if I looked at anything like, oh my God, like I can't believe that they did this. You know, I think probably like, I probably noticed that there was some things inappropriate, but I don't think it was like really like alarm bells. Like I don't remember that, but I don't know. Y'all let me know what y'all think. I'll talk to y'all later and let me know what other story or documentary or 
Let me know what y'all, what else y'all want me to recap. Like, if I didn't do so bad, I might do more, like, documentary recaps. I don't really normally do these like that because I be feeling like I be doing such a hard, a, a bad job. But because that subject was Nickelodeon, and I know y'all say, I say Nickelodeon funny. It's Nickelodeon or whatever, but I say Nickelodeon. I don't know. That's I've always said it like that. But because I loved um, Nickelodeon, 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 whatever. Because I loved it so much, I grew up watching the show. Um, my literal YouTube name derives from the brand, like a play on, on the brand. Um, I felt like it was necessary to talk about it, you know? Like, I felt it was necessary. Like, I had to, like, really, like, okay, I'm going to watch it. You know, so I definitely felt like it was a necessary to talk talk about. Um, you know, my brand ain't in any association for real, for real with the real Nickelodeon. So it is what it is, what it is, what it is. You know what I'm saying? We do remixes all the time around here. So I am in no way associated with none of that kind of creepy, cra crazy stuff at all. Um, but you said even their logo is a foot. What is the logo? Is it a foot? I thought it was a moon. I thought the... Hold on. Is that a foot? That don't look like a foot. I don't know. Anyway. All right, y'all. I'll talk to y'all later. I'll see y'all in the next one.